Our text this morning is from John chapter 15, verses 12 to 17. It's on page 902 in a Bible in a chair back near you. We'll read that in just a moment. John chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is God's word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray now that you would open our eyes to your word to see what is there that you are saying and speaking to us now through your word, through your son, and we pray you incline our hearts to receive and to love and to delight in your word. And we pray that you lead us from here today into new and glorious obedience. In the holy name of Christ we pray, amen. We're continuing in our series, Jesus Community Mission. If you were here last week, um, then you'll know that that's how we started in on Jesus. And you can go and catch up on that online uh, via our podcast or YouTube channel if you missed it. Um, Jesus community mission, I said last week, is a way of conceptualizing what it is we're doing together, our life together. How, how can we wrap around this Emmanuel Nashville in, in a category, Jesus community mission, that's how. But uh, I want to begin by reiterating something I said last week, which is that when we move, so to speak, from Jesus to community to mission, we're not leaving Jesus behind. We have faith in Jesus, we have community in Christ together, and we are on mission together with Jesus. So he is the, he is in all and he is through all and he holds the whole thing together. Uh, So therefore I've chosen a text this morning before uh, I want to talk more about community, but as a way of getting into that conversation, um, I want to, uh, I chose a text that basically fills in all the blanks between how these things fit together. Uh, John chapter 15 verses 12 to 17 is basically about participating with Jesus or in the language that John uses just before this, dwelling with Jesus or abiding in Jesus. And there's a lot here, so here's how I propose to unpack it. The first thing I wanna do is show you how the, the verses actually work together so that we know where to put the emphasis. And then uh, after I show you that, I want to unpack four aspects of this text. The command of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the friendship of Jesus, and then finally the sovereignty of Jesus. The command of Jesus, I wanna show you, is not like the command of Moses in that we can actually, by his grace, keep it. And it matters, it makes all the difference that we know that because if we think from the start that this is basically impossible, then it's a non-starter. But if we can see how it is that God empowers the command, 
then we have no reason to say no. It's so easy to say yes to him. The second thing I want to show you is that the love of, is how the love of Jesus connects to the cross of Christ. The love of Jesus is a powerfully redemptive force. And the more of his love we see, the easier it is to trust ourselves to him and to entrust our lives to the way of the love of Christ. But if we think that the love of Jesus is basically fragile, you know, works for some people, but there are better ways. We won't buy in with our whole hearts. The third thing I want to show you is that the friendship of Jesus um, is the most dignifying welcome that we can receive. It's the beating heart of his teaching here. And then finally, I want to show you how the sovereignty of Jesus secures us, comforts us, and emboldens us. So um, first, let's talk about the logic of the text. Now, John, in John's gospel, this happens uh, several times that he bookends what he wants to say so that we don't miss the point. So you'll notice verse 12 begins, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, on the other side of that bookend, there's another commandment that says something similar but slightly different. These things I command you so that you will love one another. So we're bookended by the command to love. And that's so we don't miss the point. This is about abiding in the commandment of Christ to love. But Jesus knows what we're made of. He perceives our objection. So he's always heading us off, comforting us, reassuring us, helping us to say yes to him. And that's what's happening in verses 13 to 16. He's just drilling down into uh, what he's going to do for us, what he has done for us. Uh, And uh, one of the ways that we know that that's happening is notice he says at the beginning, this is my commandment, singular, one commandment. This is my commandment. But then you get down to the end and he says, these things I command you, plural. Now what's going on here? Typically, we think of, when we hear the word command, we think like, all right, something that's told to us that we got to do. We think of marching orders. And that's a valid way to think about command, but that's not the only way the Bible uses the word command. For instance, in uh, Psalm 42, in verse 8, God commands his blessing. Same, same Greek word in the, in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament uh, that's used there is, is used here. God commands his blessing. What does that mean? Well, it's something like what Augustine of Hippo, the uh, North African bishop of the fourth century, met when he said, God, command what you will and will what you command. In other words, not only give me the command to follow, but give me the grace to follow it. And that's exactly what is happening in our text. Jesus is not only telling us or commanding us what to do, Jesus is commanding his grace into our experience so that we can say yes. That's how good he is. (laughs) So, uh, let's unpack it now. Number one, the command of Jesus. This is my commandment that you love one another. Now, Jesus taught many things during his earthly ministry. In fact, that seems to be a favorite expression of the gospel writer Mark, Uh, and he taught them many things. In fact, Uh, At the end of this gospel, of the gospel of John, the apostle is going to say to us, if we wrote down everything that Jesus did, all the books in the world couldn't contain it. In other words, Jesus had a lot to say. It's the way that he loves us. The teaching of Jesus is not simplistic, but it is clear. It's so clear and grab onable that actually Jesus can boil it down into one command. This is my wraparound category commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So there's the two great commandments brought together, love of God and love of neighbor, only this time the emphasis is on the love of God that is coming toward us. Now I know that when we hear the word command, 
Some of us are tempted to think, you know, I knew it. It's just like the law of Moses. It's just be good and God will be good to you. But if that's the case, then why is it that the people who most desired and, and lived up by, you know, tried to live up to the law of Moses are precisely the people who distinguish the commandments of Jesus from the law of Moses. In John chapter one, John says, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He knew the law of Moses. This is not the law of Moses. This is the law of Christ empowered by the grace of Christ. You might think, well, really? Where's the grace here? I mean, this feels impossible. Come on, John. Well, may the Apostle John forgive me if he's looking on. I can well imagine John replying something like this. Impossible. Did you read the last four words? I have loved you. I have loved you. Friend, is anything impossible inside of the energizing love of Jesus? So oftentimes, When it comes to the love commands of Jesus in the New Testament, we begin our thinking from the position that says, well, of course we're not really going to live up to that. Hey, but it's good to have goals. And we lose before we ever leave the blocks because we think to ourselves that Jesus has commanded an impossibility. Is it impossible in our own strength? Yes. Emphatically so, but are we left to our own strength? No. We have the resources of Christ, and that's why there's freedom in this commandment. Aren't you glad that the commandment does not say, you know, avenge one another? (sighs) Judge one another. Hate one another. Who could live up to that crushing burden? Jesus is freeing us here to channel all of our energy in one direction. Love. Leave the vengeance to him. Leave the judgment to him. And love. There are many examples that we could point to in Christian history. One of my absolute favorites comes from that wonderful, resilient woman, Corey Ten Boom, who lived through a Nazi death camp and came out the other side with faith in Christ. And she talks about a time when she was preaching after that and one of the guards from the death camp that she lived in came through the door and she recognized him immediately. The man had become a a Christian. And at the end of her talk, he came up to her and and held out his hand as, you know, a sign of, of kindness to shake her hand. And everything within her recoiled except the Holy Spirit. And she, she, said, she describes the scene. She says, woodenly, rigidly, I stuck out my hand and the feeling started in my hand and it went up my shoulder. It was as if with every step she was drawing, not from her own resources of love, but direct from the heart of Christ so that she could extend a hand to her captor. Only the love of Christ can do that. And it's ours, that power, by his grace. Number two, the love of Jesus. We could drain the ocean dry trying to talk about the love of Jesus. So I'm going to constrain my thoughts in one direction here. The reference is, of course, right on the nose 
to the cross of Christ. But that's basically uh, what oblivious people like us need. We don't need wiggle room. John knows that, so he just throws it right down the center. He is saying to us, the love of Jesus Christ for us is not cryptic, it's not hidden, it's not a read between the lines kind of love. He loved us with the greatest possible love when he laid his life down for us at the cross. He's easy to read. Now, I know that uh, there's an objection here. Someone will say, well, you know, it says here that uh, the greatest love is laying down your life for his friends. So did Jesus only die for his friends? Well, no. In fact, the Apostle Paul says that he died for his enemies. So how do we reconcile these two things? Let me see if I can uh, wrap it up in an analogy. Um, Edwin Stanton was chosen by Abraham Lincoln to be Secretary of War during the Civil War, and that was a surprise to a lot of people because Stanton had been openly and even viciously um, not kind or uh, did not have good things to say about Lincoln. But Lincoln was convinced that Stanton was the right man for the job, which turned out to be true. And uh, as you know, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated a few years later. Now, what happened then surprised everyone. No one had... higher praise to give for Abraham Lincoln after his death than Edward Stanton, Edwin Stanton. He referred to him as one of the greatest men who ever lived. In fact, he's, he's the guy who gives us that wonderful line, he belongs to the ages. So what happened to change Stanton's mind? Well, I think this insight into Abraham Lincoln's thinking helps us know. A woman once rebuked Abraham Lincoln for kind things that he said about the South after the Civil War because she thought the South should be destroyed. Lincoln replied, Madam, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? Now that's wisdom. As a matter of fact, it's godly wisdom. Nowhere is that more true than at the cross. At the cross, Jesus pulls his enemies so close that he makes them his friends. And in so doing, he actually creates in us even more love for him. We have more love in our hearts for Christ now, having once been his enemies. It's the gospel jujitsu, all of that momentum working against him. He flips it around. You like that? Oh, Dan was back there earlier. He's a jujitsu guy. I was hoping he would get that one. Um, I love the way that Thomas Goodwin, uh, the Puritan writer, describes this. Uh, he says this. Politic friendship, uh, by politic he means like conniving friendship, sort of careful, very measured friendship. Politic friendship bids you take heed of a reconciled friend that has been treacherous and has done you a mischief. But God delights in such to choose. He therefore chose forth his entirest friends. I love that. I'm going to totally pull that into my vernacular. He chose forth his entirest friends out of the sons of men that had offended him rather than make new ones. Has that thought ever occurred to you? That God could have just made new people, but he didn't. Here's what Goodwin says. For he knew they would love him better. You see what he's saying? Paul the persecutor becomes Paul the apostle, the friend of Jesus, who wants nothing more in this life than to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. Right? Peter the often oblivious and even cowardly, becomes Peter the Magnificent. Perfect? Heck no. Sincere. Why? Because he who has been forgiven much loves much. And it's the glory of Christ to love that way. That's what the cross is doing. It's Jesus glorifying himself in the most improbable way possible by dying for his enemies and making them his friends. And you see how that changes the way that we live now? Our fiercest enemies in the world right now might well be, in the future, our greatest friends. Wasn't it like that with us? Isn't that our relationship with Jesus? 
And what a resource that is. I remember, um, I think Tim Keller turned me on to this idea, a pastor in New York, uh, from Elizabeth Brunig, the New York Times um, columnist, writer, uh, who's, who observed that we've never lived in an age, there's never been an age that more constantly demanded atonement for sins and offenses, and yet at the same time disdains the idea of forgiveness. Nobody wants to forgive. How do we break through this moment? What's going to make, have you, have you am I the only one who has sensed that just the world seems angrier? And I'm not just talking about the drivers in Nashville, <laughs> but that's true. I saw a woman the other day, she told me I was number one with two hands, <laughs> you know, and frankly, I think I deserved it. I, it was bad driving. Anyway, the world is angry. It's seething. Where are we going to find the resources, as D.A. Carson put it, to see natural-born enemies reconciled? Only in the cross. We don't have it in us. Jesus has it in him. And we have to draw it from him. The love of Jesus is a powerfully redemptive force. It's the wisest strategy forward. That's number three, the love of Jesus. Number, or number two, number three, the friendship of Jesus. I just love this verse. My thoughts are always near to this verse. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in the end. Jesus is observing that if we abide in the sphere of his friendship, we will do the things that he does with him. All right, I'll talk about that a little bit in the end. But number 15 especially, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master, his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Now when Jesus says that, when he juxtaposes those two things, what he is saying to us is that what's vital in friendship is disclosure the revealing of oneself, what's on the inside that can't be seen unless it's revealed willingly, and he's done that for us. Uh, I have a friend in Alabama, he's one of my oldest friends, and uh, it's funny, you know, neither of us like to talk on the phone uh, very much, but you know, we'll, 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 it, when we see one another, we just pick right up, you know? And the truth is that there are probably a lot of people in this world who know more facts about me than him. I mean, I don't even know if he remembers my birthday, but then again, I don't really remember his, and because that, that's not really what's most important. And yet, he knows me, because he knows what I'm about, because I've let him in. He knows me. And it's just the same way when it comes to Jesus. We don't have to know all the facts about Jesus to know Jesus. For Pete's sake, he's God. A billion years from now, we'll still be surprised about new things we're learning about Jesus. All right, but we can enter into the intimacy of his disclosure. We can know him. We can know what he's about. And therefore, what God is about as we receive him in his gospel. And that's one of the most dignifying things we could ever receive, his friendship. It's the wonder of wonders, really. The most noblizing friendship in the universe. I mean, think about last week from Hebrews 1, right? I mean, he's the heir of all things. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. I mean, that's glorious, right? There's not more glory there than in his humility of friendship. Why does Jesus call? He doesn't call the cross his hour of humiliation. What does he call it? His hour of glorification. He glorifies himself by putting his love and his friendship down so low that anyone can get in on it. And every friend he receives, he dignifies with purpose. You have a destiny in Christ Jesus. And power, you have the resources of Christ Jesus. That's what he means when he says, for all that I have heard from my Father, 
I have made known to you, I've let you in, and anything that you ask the Father in my name, he'll give to you. Does that mean that every prayer that we pray, he's gonna, he's gonna answer in just the way that we pray it? No, it means that when it comes to living for Jesus, his yes is on the table, but he might answer it different than we thought. Now, I can perceive an objection here that says, you know, you keep talking about friendship with Jesus, but really, I mean, it's 21st century, we have science and stuff, and uh, he's, he's in heaven, wherever that is, and here we are on earth, and there's no such thing as friendship without proximity. I mean, if anybody knows that, it's us modern people, right? I mean, a lot of people today are talking about the inflation of, of the dollar, but the real and probably most dangerous inflation is the inflation of friendship. Everybody has a thousand, you know, friends, but very few people with whom they have disclosure. So, you know, here you are, are you saying that we can be friends with Jesus. I mean, is that like a social media friend? No, <laughs> it's not. One of the clues is actually right here in the text. When did Jesus say these words? When did he invite his disciples into his friendship? Was it when he called them to be his disciples? No. It's when he was on the way out, the way up. I mean, he's, he's headed to the cross and he's inviting them into, into friendship or declaring that he is their friend. What do we make of that? Well, Jesus tells us, it's for your advantage that I go to the Father because when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit to what? To be with you. Jesus sitting in a room with his disciples can only be with one person at a time. Jesus sitting on the throne of heaven, sending the Holy Spirit can be with us all. Our friend, the Holy Spirit. That's how we can be friends with Jesus. And I can't help but think of that wonderful text, one of my favorite in the Bible, in 2 Timothy 4. The Apostle Paul narrates a time when he was on trial and all his friends bailed on him. He says, at my first defense, no one came to my side. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. How did the Lord stand by Paul and strengthen him? Our friend, the Holy Spirit. I wonder if we've ever, the thought has occurred to us that when we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we're praying for the outpouring of the friendship of God. And what a friendship it is. Number four, the sovereignty of Jesus. Why did I choose the word sovereignty? Because this is the language of sovereignness. Um, Who is it that chooses and appoints subjects? They're sovereign. And Jesus is looking us right in the eyes and he doesn't want us to have any doubt as to where the strength of our friendship lies. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. I love that great line in Hamlet from Shakespeare. Um, Those friends that thou hast and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But who really can live up to that? The sad fact in this world is that friendship is often interrupted. Even the apostles sometimes found it easier to go separate ways and to keep loving one another from a distance. But that's not who Jesus is. 
So when he wants to comfort us as to his friendship, because the first thought that enters into our mind when we realize, wow, I mean, we have made our way into a friendship that is amazing and magnificent, and it, the first, our first thought is, I don't want to blow it. I don't want to lose it. So when Jesus wants to comfort us as to his friendship, he does not appeal to our commitment to him. He appeals to his authority over us. You did not choose me. I choose chose you. Therefore, we are secure in the friendship of Jesus. Underneath the friendship of Jesus is, are the everlasting arms of God. The power of the Holy Spirit is committed to this friendship. Look, we can mess up every relationship in this life, but we cannot offend our way out of the friendship of Jesus because we didn't earn our way into the friendship of Jesus. That's the deep exhale of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's on his shoulders. There's a little book I, uh, I come back to a lot. It's a collection of sermons. Uh, I like many of the sermons in this book. It's called Strength to Love. Sermons are by Martin Luther King Jr. So compiled sermons. And one of the uh, scenes that I love in here, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King narrates, and you know I like to read to you. You know, you can't have everything in a preacher. Sometimes you get a reading preacher. I'm sorry, all right? Um, but this is amazing, and I want to give it to you in the words of Dr. King. On a particular Monday evening, following a tension-packed week that included being arrested and receiving numerous threatening telephone calls, I spoke at a mass meeting. I attempted to convey an overt impression of strength and courage, although I was inwardly depressed and fear-stricken. At the end of the meeting, Mother Pollard came to the front of the church and said, come here, son. I immediately went to her and hugged her affectionately. Something is wrong with you, she said. You didn't talk strong tonight. Seeking further to disguise my fears, I retorted, oh, no, Mother Pollard, nothing is wrong. I'm feeling fine as ever. But her insight was discerning. Now, you can't fool me, she said. I know something's wrong. Is it that we're not doing things to please you? Or is it that the white folks are bothering you? Before I could respond, she looked directly into my eyes and said, I told you, we're with you all the way. Then her face became radiant, and she said in words of quiet certainty, but even if we ain't with you, God's going to take care of you. As she spoke these consoling words, everything in me quivered and quickened with the pulsing tremor of raw energy. Now, I doubt whether... Since the early centuries of the church, there has existed a stronger community than the one that Martin Luther King Jr. inhabited in the 50s. And they knew, don't put your faith in the community. Put your faith in God. Now, here's why I mention that. People often ask me, um, and I'm glad, please don't stop, about how to get into community here at Emmanuel. And um, I've noticed over the years that, um, you know, I'll say, do you know about um, community groups? This is not where I, like, casually advertise what's coming up. I mean, this is legit. Um, do you know about community groups? Do you know about discipleship groups? Do you know about these groups and that groups? And most of the time, people will say, yeah. And so I'm just kind of sitting there thinking, all right, well, what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> um, here's what I've noticed. Most of the time, when we say, I put myself in the same category, you know, I really want to get into community. What we really mean is, I want a friend. Now, here's why I'm landing here. I'm eager 
to see us rebuild. I mean, friends, we just lived through like a 500-year pandemic. I don't mean it felt like 500 years. I mean, it, it did do that, but that's about how long, how often they come along. And whatever, you know, September 11th did to airport security, the pandemic has done to relationships. I mean, we are, there, our relational muscles are atrophying. I don't know how you say that in the past tense, but you get the point. And we are learning again how to be friends. Therefore, it is so important that we begin with the resources of the friendship of Jesus Christ. I, I, <laughs> I want to be in vibrant and lively community. Therefore, I dare not put anything ahead of the friendship of Jesus Christ because you cannot bear the weight of my expectations for God. The first thing for me is to be comforted in the friendship of Jesus and to receive his resources so that I don't need anything from you, really. I have resources with which to befriend you. And then I can be friends with any of you, not with all of you, because I'm limited and Jesus is not. But I can be friends with any of you. So oftentimes we're looking for friends, you know, drink the same wine that we drink and, you know, play the same sports that we play, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things are great and they matter. But you know what's down deeper than that? Faith in Jesus. And you know what's really wonderful and satisfying? Knowing that this friendship is not built on things that are passing away, but it's built on Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus enables. That's what he means when he says that your fruit will abide. What is it that abides? People made in the image of God. So he's talking about relational fruitfulness. And I'll, I'll close this way. It's impossible to be in the orbit of Jesus and not be in abounding in relational fruitfulness. I mean, he's gonna get you there one way or another. My dad, I love my dad. Uh, you know, my dad teaches me so much about how to walk with Jesus, and to climb into the cab of my dad's truck is to make an open-ended commitment to do good to others. It doesn't matter what time it is. Somebody on the road that needs help, and well, we're gonna stop. When you get into his orbit, you're going to get pulled into some good works, some love. And friends, it's just the same way with Jesus. Abiding in the domain of his love, he pulls us into, in fact, the text says he appoints fruitful endeavors for us, which means that we don't have to worry how are we going to, you know, rebuild community after COVID. We just have to stay in the orbit of Jesus, inside the friendship of Jesus, and just do whatever he, he sends along next and whatever comes into our minds to do for his glory. There's like so many right answers, and he will build it among us. Friendship with Jesus is the energy of community. so any of us can get in on it. As we abide in the love of Christ, we're energized to love one another. Amen. Let's stand and continue in worship.